If you need extras, I, I did order some extras. Just let the waiters know, and they'll do that. But uh, when you get back to work and you're jittering all over the place for the sugar high, then uh, don't don't blame me. Uh, just tell them uh, tell them you're doing a lot of extra work and you're making it happen. Uh, but we certainly appreciate and are honored to have uh, our guest speaker here today, Kat Cole, and uh, we uh, thank her for taking the time out uh, to be here. She is the uh, president of Cinnabon Inc., which is a now a billion dollar company, and so it's a it's a big job that she has. Uh, she's uh, known for the Cinnabons that they're sold in the malls and the airports all those places that each and every one of us have uh, taken part of that uh, and uh, enjoyed it, and we appreciate that. She's also a member of the leadership team for Focus uh, Brands, uh, which is a franchise operator of a number of familiar brand names, including Carvel, uh, Ice Cream, Cinnabon, Schlossky's, Moe's, Southwest Grill, Aunt Annie, Ann's uh, Pretzels. And prior to her role at Cinnabon, uh, Ms. Cole was Vice President of Training and Development for Hooters of America. I believe she started there at a very young age, and she'll probably tell you a little bit about that, uh, and worked up through the organization to get to that point. And then I guess Cinnabon came calling and, uh, and uh, took her away from that. Uh, she has great experience in change management, communications, service, sales, operations, and and really multi-channel uh, brand management where uh, she's taken Cinnabond where it's uh, very much a multi-channel uh, product. And lastly, uh, and leadership. She has been the guest speaker in numerous locations across the globe and is well recognized uh, for her abilities uh, and what she has done uh, in her career. She's an avid volunteer uh, with organizations that support women and children in need, uh, fighting hunger, and working to end homeless, homelessness. Ms. Cole has uh, also appeared under Undercover, undercover Boss. I, I know when I told uh, a lot of people about her, they said, oh yeah, she was under, uh, Undercover Boss. So uh, uh, did a great job, uh, was well recognized for that. She's also been uh, on just about every uh, media network around for interviews and, and different appearances. She was recent, also recently named uh, Fortune Magazine's Top 40 Under 40. And it is our honor to have such an inspirational leader as Ms. Cole. So have, uh, to have her with us today uh, for our celebration of inspirational leaders. So let's welcome Ms. Kat Cole. Well, good afternoon and thank you so much taking some time out of your day to, and not so much to listen to me, but to celebrate inspirational leaders. And I have certainly had the great pleasure of working with so many inspirational leaders in my life, and I'm sure there are many more yet to come. So first, I'll start by talking a little bit about Cinnabon, and I've got some slides I think that'll pop up, but my story is, is really only very interesting if you understand where I came from. But first we'll start with you know, with where we are. So, you know, first, Cinnabon is, is this amazing franchise known for disturbingly delicious aromatic cinnamon rolls sold all over the world. And what is so fascinating about that is that it started as one small franchise. It started as one product. So what I like to say is there's always a core, a core of each of us, where we came from, our roots, our background, and we have a lot of potential to grow into something very different. Just like businesses, people have that same potential. And Cinnabon was no different. Two guys approached an existing cinnamon roll franchise, little known fact actually, and they went to an existing cinnamon roll franchise and said, we would love to be your franchisees. And the founders of this group said, you know, no thank you, we wanna just grow on our own and grow slowly. And, um, and, and we'll just do it on our own. And Greg and Rich Komen, the father and son duo, said, are you sure? And they said, oh yeah, we're sure. And then Greg and Rich Komen went back to Seattle, Washington, where they were from, found a fabulous branding consultant, an amazing baker and chef, and created what you now know as the world famous Cinnabon cinnamon roll. 
And that company that they tried to become a franchisee of was TJ Cinnamons. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of them. Not a lot of hands, right? <laughs> they have then gone to build Cinnabon into a world famous franchise. And so one of the interesting business lessons in the brand is sometimes it's finding the right partner to grow your business that can help you really take off. And oftentimes when you turn down those right partnership opportunities, you can miss the greatest thing that will help you grow as a person or as an individual, as a team or as a company. So Cinnabon started as this single cinnamon roll sold in a mall in Seattle, Washington and today has turned into this. Over $1 billion in consumer branded product sales around the globe, 1,200 franchise locations in over 54 countries, and this fabulous branded product manufacturer making products for people like Taco Bell and Burger King, working with companies like Pillsbury and Kellogg's just to bring more deliciousness all around the world. But it started as a single cinnamon roll. What's also interesting about that is how we actually are able to do that as a business. And I really believe that as individuals, you listen to these inspirational leaders that are being recognized today. Some of the things that allow us to be great is our ability to invest in who we are, go back to our roots, but find the right partners in life and in business to help us grow. We take a very strategic approach to building our business from reinvesting and building our brand. So think about you as an individual. How do you build your brand? How do you build that brand of the employees that you have or your family or your community so they're known for what matters most and what means a lot to them? And then we understand that if we don't take certain moves in our life or in our business, our competition will. So I want you to remember that and think about that from a business perspective. If I don't, my competition will. If I don't become the great partner in baking and indulgence and food service, my competition will. If I don't go knocking on that door of a potential client, my competition will. If I don't spend time having coffee and lunches with the great talent that I'm trying to recruit, my competition will. And you have to ask yourself if you're okay with that. And Cinnabon is a phenomenal story in building a global multi-channel brand by telling themselves and asking themselves that question. If not me, who? If not now, when? If we don't go after this opportunity to build our brand, protect our position in the marketplace, and continue to grow, who will? And the answer is our competition. And we take a, a very strategic approach to protecting our brand, investing in our franchise partners, but also making sure that we are pushing the envelope in the different areas that our brand can show up. Having done that, one of the things that we've focused on a lot is innovation. Cinnabon started as a cinnamon roll, a giant, delicious, over-the-top cinnamon roll, but has expanded to teeny tiny cinnamon rolls, like little tiny 80 calorie bites, if you've ever seen them in the malls and the airports, so you can indulge in the way that you want to. But in order for us to stay competitive and relevant, we have to change. If all we sold were cinnamon rolls today, I assure you we would not be able to afford the premium rents in the venues where we do business, and we certainly wouldn't be a relevant place for you, your friends, and your family to come by and shop and treat yourselves because not everyone can have that ooey gooey delicious cinnamon roll today. And even if you could, you can't do it every day or every week, but maybe our iced coffee you can, or the small sandwiches we have made with our dough in some of our locations. Having the courage to expand from our core, but the discipline to keep it aligned with our brand is what has allowed the business to continue to grow despite massive increases in economic headwinds and competition. That is our new normal, by the way, in any industry. Massive economic headwinds, huge increase in competition. I speak for industry groups all over the world. I just spoke with a large marketing organization before that, uh, the global travel organization that manages fuel and truck stops before that, an organization of global attorneys fighting to advocate for business. And everyone's talking about the new normal. And so every time I speak, I say, hey, no offense, but stop calling it the new normal. It just is what it is for everyone. And so in order to be competitive as whether you're students and looking for your first job, whether you're entrepreneurs and looking to build and expand your business, this is the way we have to evolve and stay competitive in today's marketplace by staying true to our core, who we are as people, who we are as brands and companies, but having the openness and the flexibility to expand and partner so that we stay relevant as a business. So Cinnabon has continued to do that, not only with our menu, evolving our menu items, but having the discipline to shrink to grow. An interesting lesson I learned from Cinnabon, and it actually started a little bit before I came on board. 
So everyone is aware of the recession and the economic challenges that came from 07, 08, and 09. But imagine you run a business that solely relies on traffic in malls and airports. When people have no discretionary income, they do not shop, they do not travel, they do not gamble, they do, do not go to any of the places where we do business, which means we have no humans to sell to. So what do you do when what you rely upon to be your customer no longer has the income to buy your product? How do you grow? And Cinnabon and the leadership team had the discipline to say, okay, we have this big franchise, and by the way, all the capital has dried up, and not a lot of people have access to the funds needed to build the franchise business. So how do we grow? So you had a group of people who said, well, we'll just try to fight harder and deal with the challenge, and everybody's going through it too, so we'll be okay. But you had a, a group of courageous people who said, maybe we should shrink to grow. Maybe we should have a version of our business offering that's smaller, more affordable, has easier access, lower cost of investment, and can be put in more places. And out of that discussion, Cinnabon Express was born, a teeny tiny version of our franchise that could then grow inside of other restaurant chains. If we had not had that smaller version of our business, we would have had net negative youth growth for several years back to back in the United States. But because we had the courage and the leadership team at that time had the foresight to see sometimes you have to shrink to grow, that allowed us to grow. Here's what's challenging about that, by the way, if, for those of you who are business people in the audience. Anytime you go to investors, partners, or your core business strategist, and you say, we have this thing that brings in a large amount of money, and I have an idea to create this thing that brings in less money. That sounds like a really bad idea. <laughs> because why would I give someone an opportunity to trade down from the big thing to the little thing? This conversation happens everywhere, in every industry, whether you're a single startup a entrepreneur or a large global Fortune 50 business. How do we stay relevant? The question is about relevance. So here's what happens on the menu side. We have these giant cinnamon rolls, right? How many of you could eat the giant Cinnabon cinnamon roll once a month? That's 880 calories, by the way. Raise your hands. Okay. So now you have the mini bun on your tables. That's only 320 calories. How many of you could treat yourself with that once a month? A lot more people raise their hand, right? So, so would one or two of you possibly trade down from the big thing to the little thing? Sure. But I just gained 100 of you who wouldn't have bought anything otherwise. And so I learned a lot from watching how Cinnabon has evolved and having the discipline sometimes. Sometimes you can't get what you want in the way that you want it because there are factors beyond your control, because the environment shifts, the competitive landscape changes, competition comes into the market. So then you have to get creative and get what you are trying to achieve in a different way, in a more creative way, in a more flexible way. And the only brands and businesses that will live over the next 5, 10, 20 years are not brands and businesses that have a particular product. They are the brands and businesses that have the discipline and the core competency of being flexible, of being able to partner, of being able to understand that just because we have been on one path for the last two years or five years or 10 years, that does not mean that that is the path that will take us to continued success for future periods of time. And Cinnabon has done that incredibly well. Beyond being flexible, we've gotten great at partnering. And I am so passionate about partnering in life and in business. It is very hard to succeed today alone. That is a long and expensive journey. But if you can find the right partner as a business, maybe it's the Chamber of Commerce, maybe it's a local academic institution, maybe it's another business that is very similar to yours and who you might have initially thought would be competition. But in fact, they may bring something to the table that you don't, and you may bring something to the table that they don't. The example of that is our partnership with Burger King and Taco Bell. Some might say, wow, you're a, you're a food service business. You make cinnamon rolls. Why would you go partner with another food service business to give them your cinnamon rolls? Doesn't that compete? And the answer is absolutely not. In fact, it's the opposite. They have 7,100 locations in Burger King where we could put our world famous product, giving it easier access to people than what one might say 
is a difficult point of access in a mall or an airport. And we can bring them authority and credibility in baking. It's actually a beautiful partnership. Same thing with Taco Bell and other restaurants where we make products where you might not have heard about it. I share this story with you because as I tell you my personal journey and where I came from and how I learned the importance of partnering, you can see how it materializes itself in business to drive real value for partners and for consumers. There are so many people today who say, I'm not going to go into a mall or I don't go to an airport, so how do I get my yummy treats to you? I do it by partnering with other manufacturers and other retailers who can deliver a product in a way and in a venue where it matters to you, where you have access at that point. So think about your own business or your own ideas if you're a student and what you want to accomplish and how that applies to you and what you might want to achieve. Yes, Cinnabon Inc. could build 7,100 locations. It has taken us 28 years to build 1,200. <laughs> so that would be a very long, long path. So sometimes partnering is also what increases not only your value, but your speed to achieving your goals. And I think it's an important lesson in business today. We don't just partner with those companies, we also extend our brand. We're so confident in the core of our business. We so know what we own, which is high quality indulgence, that we have extended that into products like Green Mountain K-Cups. So if you want a fat-free Cinnabon, you can get it through our vodka, our K-Cups, our coffee, or our Airwick aromatics. The only way you can indulge with Cinnabon fat-free. But that allows people to indulge with our brand in the way that they want to and still enjoy our world-famous flavors. This is a discipline and a competency to manage a global multi-channel brand, do it with grace, pick the right partners, have the discipline to say no to opportunities whenever they come along, but still continue to build and extend our business for our franchisees and our brand for all of our stakeholders. So that's where Cinnabon is today. One of the reasons the brand has had a resurgence in the last three years has been because of our focus on connections. So, so far I've talked about partnering and flexibility, but connections are what allow us to be real and relevant to consumers wherever they are. They also allow us to be more attractive, by the way, to other companies who might want to partner with us. Whether it's us being willing to put our reputation on the line, going on a totally unscripted reality television show like Undercover Boss, and by the way, I saw it live when 10 million people saw it. You do not get to see it in advance. There is no editorial control. They can say anything that they want. They can put you in whatever light they wish, whatever creates good TV, and you're just sitting there praying. <laughs> Please <laughs> let us let it come across you know, really well. And we were fortunate in that case. We have wonderful, sweet employees, and that's who was profiled, and we were able to change several employees' lives. And the, and the biggest benefit of putting ourselves out there was not the press that we got or the sales increases that we got. All of those things came. But the biggest benefit was the pride that our employees felt in seeing their brand and their company on national television portrayed so positively. There is nothing I could have done in that short amount of time that would have allowed our employees to feel that level of pride. I could have created an incentive contest, they could have all gotten a 10% pay raise, we could have launched a new product, we could have done all kinds of things. We could have put up billboards that says, our people are awesome. But nothing would have elevated their pride like seeing their brand portrayed so positively. And so that pride combined with all of the business benefits that we got from not only that show, but the associated PR tells you one important thing. People care and are motivated by being inspired and knowing that they are working with, buying from, or working for really good people. People vote with their wallets when they know there's a good family or a good person or a good company behind a product. Employees stay through the tough times when they know they're working for good people. Their bosses matter, their peer environments matter, the reputation of your organization matters. That level of pride is what allows you to retain employees and build a business. And I couldn't be more proud of the franchisees and the brand and the employees that we have. And that pride does allow us to have more confidence in taking risks to put our brand out there. 
So here are the business lessons from Cinnabon. It is about flexibility and partnering and growing. And all of those things are what have allowed this brand to become one of the world's greatest indulgent food brands hitting a billion dollars in global product sales. It is a fascinating business story and I've been lucky to be a part of it for just three and a half short years. We've got an awesome team and a lot of really cool stuff still yet to come. But having the opportunity to lead Cinnabon where my role is to build the team that drives the growth, to support and advocate for our franchisees and build our brand across our many divisions at Focus Brands and International and licensing and business development that extend our brand. That's my job every day and to be a constant ambassador for our brand. But that story about the brand, while there are great business lessons in it, and the description of my job are interesting, but that's probably not what has the most relevance to you. What has the most relevance to you, I think, for the theme of inspirational leaders is actually how I got to where I am today doing those things that I've just described. When I was nine years old, uh, I was the oldest, still am, the oldest of three girls. That's me and my mom and my two sisters. I'm the one at the top in the middle, although now I look like my mom <laughs> over there on the right. And when I was nine, she came to me and said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving. And what she meant was we were leaving our father. He was a sweet man, a kind man, but an alcoholic and not a good father or husband at the time. And it had gotten to the point where my mother realized that we would be better and safer if we were out on our own. She had no money. She barely graduated high school. No one in my family had ever gotten into, much less attended college. And she had an entry level administrative job. And it was likely that if she divorced our father, who actually had a very good job, and had put a very nice roof over our head and gave us a great living, best living anyone on either side of our family had, that things were going to be tough. And she knew it, but she still came to me and said, that's it, I'm done, we're leaving, I can't take it anymore. And at nine years old, I did not cry, I did not say, what's gonna happen? I said, what took you so long? At nine. The business lesson in that although I didn't realize it at the time at the age of nine, but upon reflection, I have taken the lesson from it, is that oftentimes in our lives, personal or professional, the people closest to us, around us, know what the right thing to do is long before we ever have the guts to make the call. They are the ones dealing with it day to day. The employees are on the front line. They know what the guests are saying. The students are dealing with the real life. They know what's going on. Your family members who see you every day, who see you over periods of time and see you change in your struggles and your strengths, they know what the right thing is, but it's only your call to make. In that case, my mom was the leader of the team. She was the leader of my family. And only she could make that call. So that's the first business lesson I learned from my mom when I reflect on all the great things that I have learned from the person who is my most inspirational leader. So then we leave our father, and she has no money, and we are all too young to work. So my mom fed us on a budget of $10 a week, a food budget of $10 a week for three years. We kept a roof over our head, and it could have been so much worse. We weren't sleeping on the streets. We weren't in a car. We had a house, and we had food. I learned to love beanie weenies and potted meat. <laughs> they are awesome and turn hamburger meat into chili. That's pretty much what we lived off of for three years. And I learned about what it takes to be a graceful leader in times of change. She could have cussed our father up and down. She could have talked negatively about him. She had every right to be upset, disappointed, and frustrated. But in front of us, her team, she never did it once. I mean not once. She was always so positive. She was so focused on the fact that, you know what, things could just be a lot worse. And so we should all be lucky. We have each other, we have good things, and it'll all be okay. And in fact, another leadership lesson is when you do make the right call for the right reasons, things eventually, even if they start tough, do end up okay. My mother ended up remarrying a wonderful man who she's still married to today. My father could not be better off. He has since gotten, a, after going through a very tough many decades in his life, 
has improved and is as healthy as he's ever been. And I truly believe if my mom had not made that call that that would not be the case. My younger sisters are doing great. Everyone's doing great. And so when I asked my mom later as I've grown up, I said, um, what did take you so long? Because by the way, it was bad for a long time. It was bad from the time that the little one was a baby. And I was nine and they were five and three in this picture. So this picture was taken just before my mom left our father. And I said, what did take you so long? And she said, honestly, because everyone around me, even my mother, my father's mother, and her peers said, how dare you walk away from a situation that is so good compared to all of us? Your husband has a nice job. You have a roof over your head. We don't have nearly the nice things that you do. You should be grateful that you're in that situation. And for years, she allowed other people to convince her that because things could be so much worse, she had no right to desire to make them better. No right to desire to make them better. And then one day she said something just happened. Nothing crazy, just another night of the same thing. And she had just had it. And she literally crossed the line from believing just because things could be worse, I do not deserve to make them better, to moving over and saying, you know what? Just because things could be worse does not mean I do not deserve to make them better. In fact, it also does not mean that I am still not obligated to try to make them better. I invest in and advise several startups, technology startups, consumer packaged goods companies, small companies who are trying to find their way. And I can't tell you how often I watch entrepreneurs encounter this state of mind. Hey, we're doing great. Things could be worse. Why should we spend that extra time to go after that client? Why should we spend that extra time to go after that great employee or leader? The answer is because if you don't, your competition will. And so the, the question I've learned to ask that I learned from my mom is if not me, who, if not now, when? I mentioned how we've asked that at Cinnabon. I learned that from my mom. My mom eventually said, if I don't take my kids out of this situation, who will? And the answer, by the way, was the state. <laughs> they would have taken us away. And if she didn't do it when she did it, what might have happened? And I will tell you, it would have been very bad because it was already bad. She finally made the call. I watched her figure things out and make it happen. I watched her lead with grace. I watched her be positive. I watched her challenge herself to just make things happen and not look to others and continue to move up in her own company and her own career at the same time. I had the privilege of growing up in this situation. I had the privilege of seeing an incredibly strong leader and a strong woman, and I didn't even realize it at the time. She was just my mom. And then as I got older, met other people, learned of other people's family situations, and then realized some of the strengths I had as a leader when people said, how do you know to do that? Or why do you feel so comfortable doing that? Where do you get your confidence from? That lady, <laughs> she used to grab me by the shoulders and say, you can do anything. Not like you can do anything, pat me on the head, go run along. I mean, you can do anything, and I'm expecting you to do everything. Don't make all my work not worth it. And I could not be more grateful for that inspirational leader. So time goes on. Things are getting a little better. I'm 15. I start working in malls, selling clothes, and I took a part-time job also cleaning gym equipment so I could have the exchange for the gym membership to help support my my muscle building for my track and cheerleading um, sports in high school. And then at 17, I get recruited to go work at Hooters Restaurant. I'm in high school, I'm a senior, so uh, I go work in Hooters Restaurant. And it's a little hard to see on this screen, but that is me down at the middle in the infamous Hooters uniform when I was 18 years old. So I started as a hostess, opening up the door, welcome to Hooters, running food, cleaning bathrooms, bussing tables. I grew up working every job in the restaurant industry, from the front of the house to the back of the house. If it had to be cleaned or served or made, I did it. At the age of 18, I'm still in high school. Now I'm old enough to serve alcohol and therefore be a server, so I became the official Hooters score, you know, rocking the orange shorts and, and serving chicken wings. Come that summer, I had graduated from high school and was the first person on either side of my family to ever get into college, and I had a dream. And my dream was to get my engineering degree, electrical engineering, computer sciences, with a minor in chemical engineering, and then to go to law school. That was my dream. 
And the reason that was my dream is because I had seen a paint can that said DuPont Chemicals. And I thought that must be a really big company and so I should go work for them. And I learned they were a chemical company and then I figured getting an engineering degree would help me get into the company and then being a lawyer would help me meet my, all my teacher's suggestions that since I like to talk a lot and was incredibly argumentative that I should be an attorney. <laughs> so that was the dream. And so I'm fast forward a year, I'm in school, I'm kicking butt and taking names and a few things happened over that year. One uh, was the entire staff of the cooks in the middle of one shift walked out. I don't know why they got mad at the manager. I think somebody said they had stolen their pot or something happened. You know, kitchen employees at that time doing crazy funny things. And so they got mad at the manager and they all walked out mid-shift. So here is my mentality. I'm a server and my income depends on that, those guests at that table having a great experience. First of all, they need to get their food in order to want to pay me and then they need to have a great experience. So here I am conflicted. What do I do? There's no way that I can provide any type of food for them without it being cooked. And so I learned in that moment that there are two types of people in the world. When bad things happen, when challenges occur, there are inherently a group of people who seek to help. They're just curious. They want to figure out if they can help. They're not afraid of screwing it up because it's a better alternative than nothing happening. And then there are others who tend to kind of stand aside and handle other things. Well, I was the hand raiser person. So I jumped into the kitchen and made chicken wings for the whole rest of the shift. I would make them, we would get the food out for the rest of the staff, me, two other employees, by the way, I wasn't the only one, and our manager. And then would run out to the front and go make sure the tables were okay, and they thought it was pretty cool seeing the employees going back and cooking the kitchen since it was an open kitchen. And by the way, frying chicken wings with little orange shorts and pantyhose on is a really bad idea. <laughs> They're flammable, <laughs> so I had little flame spots going on. It was pretty, a pretty funny shift, pretty funny experience. But that happened, not that exact thing, but things like that happened many times that year. The manager needed help. Another employee needed to leave and take care of her child. And I had several opportunities to just be curious and helpful. So later that year, now I'm 19 years old, I get a phone call at the restaurant, actually my manager did, that said we're opening our first ever Hooters restaurant in Sydney, Australia. And we are looking for a team of top employees to go travel, and help train the new employees there to open that restaurant. By the way, that's totally normal in the restaurant business. Australia, maybe not so normal, but that element is very normal. And my manager came to me and said, I think you're the person. However, remember, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, single parent. Um, I often describe my family upbringing as Jerry Springer. You know that show? <laughs> that's what my life was like, both sides of the family. I say that affectionately, and that's being very kind. I assure you. <laughs> And, and so they're asking me to go open this restaurant in Australia. I had never been on a plane. I had never been on any mass transportation at all. I had only been out of the state of Florida twice, once for a cheerleading competition, another for a girl's trip in Savannah, Georgia. I had barely escaped my roots. And here I am confronted with an opportunity to go to Australia at 19 and help open that franchise. And here's what I didn't do that so many people do in life. I didn't listen to all those reasons that I could have listened to to say, no, I can't go. I had some pretty good reasons. Number one, I couldn't legally exit the country. That's a pretty good reason. I didn't have a passport. I had never done anything like that. I had never opened a restaurant. I had never, and then fill in the blank, everything they were asking me to do. So I called my mom, my great inspirational leader, and said, how can I do this? And she called some friends and said, actually, if you buy your first flight ever tonight and fly to Miami, you can stand in line with all of your paperwork and get a passport in one day. And that, in fact, is what I did. I flew to Miami. I stood in line. I got my passport. I flew back that next day and had my manager call and say the answer is yes, she can go. They never knew I didn't have a passport. They never, my manager did, but the corporate office didn't. They never knew I flew to Miami. And as far as they knew, they were asking a very competent person to go open <laughs> this restaurant. And I was so grateful for the opportunity. And I asked my manager before I left, I said, why me? And she said, because you've worked every job in this business. I can rely on you. You're good with your peers. And you know how to teach other people. Why not you? And I learned then the power of believing in others more than they believe in themselves. And that has become my core competency.
no matter what I do in life, no matter what company I run, no matter what nonprofit work I do, I will always actually be doing the exact same thing everywhere I go, helping people and teams and groups and companies and communities realize they are capable of more than they know. That's what I do. Everybody has a gift, that's mine. And I learned it actually by receiving it, by having people constantly believe in me a little bit more than I did in myself, seeing something in me that I didn't quite know I was capable of. But at the same time, so I give them all the credit for that, at the same time, I had the courage to step forward because I believed in myself, because I had people around me who gave me reasons to believe in myself. I wasn't torn down and beaten down by my peers. I didn't have parents who neglected me. Even my father, as tough as he was, he still loved us very much. And I was so lucky to have that from my mom. And that is why I took that first step, I believe, to opening businesses all over the world. We opened the restaurant in Australia successfully. It changed my life, as you can imagine. When I get to the Sydney airport, ready to fly back to Jacksonville, where I still lived at the time, I picked up every business magazine that I could, just so I could understand and learn, what is this whole like opening businesses thing about? It didn't take me off my track at that point to become an engineer and attorney. I was just interested, but I thought, this is a one-time experience, once in a lifetime. Doesn't that sound like once in a lifetime? I mean, who would ever ask you to do that again? And so I come back, I go back to school. Three months later, uh, I was asked to go open the first of our franchises in Central America. Three months after that, I was asked to go open the first of our franchises in South America. At that point, was to lead the team, and I had just barely turned 20. So I opened the first one in South America in Buenos Aires. And that pattern continued, so much so that I was failing college. <laughs> because I was never there. <laughs> and because I was never there, I sat down with my professors. And they said, you have to make a choice. I love these fork in the road moments in life and in business. You know when they occur. You can feel it in your gut. It's a fork in the road. You've got to make a choice. And rarely is, it, is one a very obvious choice. Often they're sort of comparative. Do I go down this path with my business or this path with my, my personal choices? What, you know, which path should I go down? And I was a little torn because I was the first person to ever get into college. And I knew I would be letting my mom down. And so then I had to realize what was more important, letting my mom down or letting myself down. And so I called my mom and I said, they're telling me I, there's no way for me to make this up and still work. You know, I've got to come back to school and commit. And she said, I'll be terribly disappointed, but you've got to do what feeds your soul. And it was traveling and opening businesses. And so I quit. I'm a college dropout. I dropped out my second year in college. A couple months later, I was asked to interview for my first ever corporate job to move to Atlanta, Georgia, which is what got me here, to oversee global employee training and development for Hooters Restaurant. I took the job, I packed up my U-Haul, I drove to Atlanta, and I wasn't even old enough to rent a car yet. And yet I was leading employee training for the company. Every year and a half, I took on a new job, and I learned a few things while I worked there at Hooters on the corporate side. One, when you work at Hooters as a Hooters girl, and you're in the restaurants, everyone who's there wants to be there. So you really don't understand acutely how others outside of the business viewed the brand. So then, fast forward, I'm in a suit. I'm going to conventions and business uh, meetings, in particular those that support the elevation and education of women in business, and I go to introduce myself. And so I'm in a suit, so I look like everyone else, deceivingly. And I walk up, and I introduce myself, and I say, hi, my name is Kat, and they say, oh, I, here I am, I work for fill in the blank, you know, Coke or Pepsi or Chick-fil-A or McDonald's, all these very typical companies that don't have much controversy around them in the ways that mine did. And they would say, well, where do you work? And I would go, here we go. <laughs> Three, two, one, Hooters. And many of them, at least at first, would respond, oh, 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 <laughs> and literally walk away. And I had never dealt with that before. I hadn't dealt with being thought less of because of a choice that I made. I hadn't dealt with that. And a lot of people say, well, that's surprising. You worked in the restaurants. Remember, everyone wanted to be there. They liked it. <laughs> there were no issues in the restaurants. It was when I got outside that I realized the conflict that people had around the brand. And then I had a woman come up to me who was very cool, very smart, and in one of my first conferences for women in business, and she said, how 
can you work there? They exploit women. And you say you're about elevating women. How can you work there? How do you reconcile that at night? How do you look yourself in the mirror? And I thought, wow. First of all, I always respect someone who can you know, bring their opinions forward and ask questions and confront you. That productive conflict uh, can really help people move forward. And so I thought about it. I, I didn't respond negatively. I didn't get defensive. And the answer came pretty quickly. I said, because my level of pride in what we do every day and the people I train and develop and the opportunities that I have been lucky enough to receive far exceeds my level of concern about what other people think. And at the time that that ceases to be the case, I will exit. But until then, I have to be a realist. Here's what was true. On paper, I was a train wreck. Single parent household, alcoholic father, college dropout, worked for Hooters. <laughs> if you just look at that on paper, it certainly does not appear to be very compelling <laughs> on a resume. But in real life, if I'm put in charge of your business, I am a sure bet. And I knew it. In fact, I knew all the good things we had done. We employed more women as a percentage of employees than any other restaurant chain in the world. We had the most competitive tuition reimbursement program in all of hospitality to help those young women put themselves through college. And every boss I had from the time I was 17 until I turned 26 and became the youngest vice president in that company had been a woman. Every person who ever hired me, trained me, developed me, and promoted me was actually a woman. And so few people knew that and they were almost all women who had moved up from within the restaurant. And that is why my level of pride exceeded the concern about what other people thought, because I knew how much good was going on. So working there helped me build a thick skin, as you can imagine, and it helped me be very sure about myself and about my choices and about what made me want to be somewhere and the type of people that I wanted to work with. I was also a realist and understood that because I was such a train wreck on paper, it's not like I could walk into Coca-Cola Enterprises and get a top job. At the age of 26, I was one of the vice presidents of a company doing about 800 million in revenue in 20 countries. I was a part of a leadership team that shaped the organization. I got to deal with some crazy, crazy things because it was privately held. We bought an airline, we ran an airline, terrible idea by the way. And then we sold the airline, which was a wonderful idea. We were almost fully vertically integrated. We owned most of our own manufacturing and much of our own distribution. I had the opportunity to have exposure and involvement to elements of business that most people never will in their lifetime by the time I was 26. And so in my mind, there wasn't enough that I could do to repay that organization. And so I learned to be very resolute in one thing, and that is gratitude being grateful for those who support you, being grateful for the opportunities you get, and then being deathly afraid that you will let those people down and allowing that to propel you to work harder and longer and smarter and better than everybody else in the business. And that is what drove me. I didn't wanna let my mom down. I didn't wanna let all those people who gave me chances at 19 and at 20 and at 22 and at 25. I couldn't bear the thought of letting them down. I also, was deathly afraid of being defined by where I came from. And my mom, every year on my birthday, which I just had, sends me a card, and she still did it this time, that says, don't you dare forget where you came from, but don't you dare let it define you. And I was always running from where I came from, but as I've gotten older, I've realized it is the very thing that makes me unique and special. And so while I still have that burning desire to not be defined, in the same way that the place where I came from is defined. I have grown a deep level of appreciation to protect those roots. And actually, that's no different than what Cinnabon has done or many other great companies. They know where they came from, they move from it, they don't forget it, but they do not allow themselves to be solely defined by it. That's what great companies do, great leaders, great family members, great universities. That's what we do to be resilient. And I learned those lessons and so many more working shockingly at Hooters. And that's why I always say, whenever I give speeches or share with people that I mentor, that I have learned lessons in leadership and in inspirational leadership from some of the most 
unexpected places, including Hooters. So then while I'm at Hooters, a couple things happen. The CEO dies unexpectedly. Privately held company, president, CEO, chairman of the board, sole stockholder and shareholder. I called him a walking conflict of interest. And he passed away suddenly at the age of 69, young age of 69. And he put his son in place to take over the company. His son didn't ask for the job. He didn't interview for the job, and he had never run a company in his life. Here you go, take over Hooters, the 800, and now at that point almost $900 million a year company doing business in 33 countries. Good luck. The beautiful thing about that is that because he was not seasoned and experienced in that role, it gave opportunities for my fellow executives and I to step up. And I think it's so important to realize when you are around someone who might be light in competency, or when you go take over a company that has some issues, or you're mentoring someone that has some challenges, those very um, vacuums of whatever that skill or competency is are what allow you to step up. In fact, they are what obligate you to step up. I am who I am and I have done what I have done because of the great people I've been able to work with who have allowed me to step up without maybe the specific experience to work with them to do great things. Other people have done that for me and this is what I remember now. By way of volunteering, giving of myself, I spend a lot of time in nonprofits. I have learned that not only are all those people the ones who gave me my opportunities, but I can be that person for someone. I mentor and meet young people in, in colleges all the time. I was just at Columbia University this weekend speaking to their entrepreneurial students. And I sat down with them and they were asking about mentors and who they could look up to. And I pushed back on them and I said, you, you'll get the best mentoring from being a mentor. You are that person to someone. I don't care who you are in this room. I don't care if you are 90 or 19. You can inspire someone. There are people who watch you, who look up to you, who watch your decisions, watch what you do say and don't say, and they learn from it. And it's an awful shame and an awful waste if we don't apply our time on this earth to be able to use that, that influence for good. And I learned that a lot through volunteering and leading nonprofit organizations like the Women's Food Service Forum, industry organizations, and other groups. But the most influential places where I have learned my business lessons are actually from my nonprofit work in Eastern Africa. I've been doing work in Eastern Africa for about the last seven years, starting in Rwanda and then moving over to Somalia, the Sudan, and Ethiopia. And I've learned a few lessons that I have applied so directly to business that have added real financial value and allowed me to become a great leader. So this is a village in eastern Ethiopia on the border of Somalia. And what's meaningful about that is that is where Al-Qaeda comes in and sets up cells. They come in through Yemen and Djibouti into Somalia and cross the Ethiopian border because there are many people who are destitute and desperate for resources. And so in exchange for doing violent acts, they will get food and money. And so you've got millions of people along these borders that could become essentially weapons for Al-Qaeda. And so we go, along with many other groups around the world, to help these villages learn to elevate themselves so they don't need that from someone else. They can depend on themselves. And so the first time I went into Ethiopia, I was asking one of the village leaders, can you tell me how it is that we drive past this little village where people are clearly dying to go to the big village. Doesn't every life matter? And he said, yes, of course it does. But just like in your businesses, we have a finite amount of resources and time. And we have to focus on things that are small enough to change, meaning within our control, but big enough to matter. And that may sound cold and hard, but tough decisions are. And I had a friend who was with us her first time in Africa, not mine, it was hers, and she saw a woman dying in the front of a market with a baby. And that is not an unusual sight, but this woman and her infant, the child could not have been more than a couple weeks old, were clearly in their last days. And she said, I've got to go, she was a very empathetic person, I've got to go give them my money, um, I've got to help them. And I said, if you do that, number one, you will be mobbed, literally mobbed, and we may not have you around to be helping other people. And two, that money's not going to help her. And those are the tough decisions that parents have to make, that leaders have to make about our resources and our time. Lots of people need us and want us. 
lots of opportunities out there to build our business, but we have to focus on things that are within our control, small enough to change, but big enough to matter, what's gonna be the greatest return on effort? And that, that quote, by the way, is from a man named Billy Shore, who founded a group called Share Our Strength and has a program called No Kid Hungry. They do the Taste of the Nation and Great American Dine Out, and I love that quote. Then we're sitting in this village, in this group, in Garmam, and we're around these village leaders that had all been elected by their peers and guided by our group to oversee the five areas that drive a village to self-sufficiency. And so we're sitting around and one of my friends, also the first time in Eastern Africa, says, um, what are your priorities? What can we help you with? We can go back, we can raise funds, we can do tweet-a-thons, we can do all this cool stuff. And so it's being translated in three languages because there's so many dialects are spoken there. So as it gets around, they say water. Our priority is water. There's water there, but it's well below the ground. And then even when you get it up, it's full of saline. And then even if you got it up and weren't going to drink it, it's got to get to the higher ground where the crops are. So it's got to be transported. So water, broadly, is our biggest problem. And my friend says, OK, great. What else? Because remember, we have resources and friends and all of this. And, and the what else comment gets translated, and they are, all start laughing. And they say our priorities are water and water and water. And in that moment, I thought, wow to have such clarity on your priorities. There's no question as to why they have such clarity because the punishment for making the wrong choice out of order is death. <laughs> That's not the case in the developed world. We don't get that type of punishment. We waste some resources, maybe we mess up some time, but we don't get that cold reaction, that hard result when we make a prioritization mistake. And as a result, we have become very bad prioritizers in our personal lives and in business. And several years ago, when I had this conversation, it made me a better leader. I came back to our company and said, what is the one thing we could do that everything else after it will be more powerful as a result? Think about asking yourself that question. By the way, for all of us personally, it's our health. What is the one thing we can do that will make everything else we do more effective as a result? It's taking care of ourselves. For a company, there are many ways that that shows up. So I'll give you an example. At Cinnabon, we were launching new menus, uh, new menu items, kind of some of the pictures I showed you there. And they were all ready to launch, well-tested, delicious. And so I go to my team, who's very smart, who'd worked very hard in getting our franchisees excited about the sandwiches and the donuts and all the new products. And literally, as a result of this village trip, I said, wait a minute. How are people going to know that it's there? Think about our environments. We're behind a counter. You're walking with your bags in the mall or with your bags at an airport. You see us, you smell us, you're trying to avoid us like the plague because you don't want to go there. You're thinking, oh, it smells so good and I have the money to do it, but I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't. And so you're doing everything you can not to look because you can smell. And so I said, how are we going to get people's attention? All these products might add 2 or 3% in sales, but if we found a better way to communicate broadly first and invest in that first, then those things will have a higher likelihood of results. So we paused the initiative, by the way, that we had worked on for a year and spent another nine months implementing new merchandising solutions, digital menu boards, and different displays that would allow a greater return on effort. And the locations that made those investments have a 50% higher return on those product investments. 50%. Because we got good at priorities. That's important to remember in your personal life and in business. And then we're in a village, and we leave, and we hear that one of the village leaders, Ibrahim, this is Ibrahim, and his daughter Naima was very sick and dying, and if they say someone's dying, they are literally on their deathbed. So the people in our truck decided to turn around and go back and pick him up. And a little backstory. At this point, these villages, by the way, see people come and go from the outside. They have the same attitude I had as a Hooters girl about managers. I've been here before you. I'm going to be here after you. So I'm going to keep doing the same thing until you're gone. That's how employees feel when there's high turnover and a lot of change at the top. They feel they can only trust themselves. And this village was no different. But what changed was when we turned around and picked up Ibrahim. We left. And the minute we left that village, even if Ibrahim had died, one minute later, that village all of a sudden believed they could trust us. We were there when it counted. I encourage you to find opportunities in your business and in your community to be there for people when it counts, because trust is the foundation of sustainable business. And sustainable business is the foundation of sustainable income 
and profit. But without trust, you're just a transaction. Interestingly, when I first took over Cinnabon, I made a huge mistake, probably the biggest professional mistake I had ever made. Worst time in my career, hands down. I came on board with the brand, and we were growing fast. And we had a lot of initiatives. And one of them had been communicated to our franchisees. And it was communicated as, let's just call it X. And by the time it hit the market, let's just say it was Y. And it was so bad that I got an email from the founder of Cinnabon that just said, WTF, question mark, question mark, question mark. And he doesn't talk like that. And so began probably one of the more important leadership lessons I have had in recent years. That was only a reminder to me of how important this is because of my experience in Ethiopia. Here's what happened. Essentially, I did not ask the right questions. As the leader, I was hired as the president of Cinnabon. But I had so much respect for other people who had been doing things before I got there. And so I did what you should never do. I stepped back a little. I didn't want to probe too hard. I didn't want to ask too many questions and stop the momentum. And because I kept it at the surface and didn't go deep, I missed very important things that would have allowed me to redirect the communication, manage the expectations, and protect trust. I failed. I, I thought about when that stuff was going on, imagine if my mom had taken that approach. Imagine if she had decided not to ask questions, not to make the tough call, not to probe. She was the only person in the position to do it. If not her, who? If not, then when? And now here I am in a position of ultimate leadership, leading the brand. I'm the only one who can make a difference, and I failed to ask the right questions. And as a result, we ended up with a total fractured trust in our system. And I had only been there for four months working to do nothing but build that trust. Long story short, as a team, with our ownership group, we agreed that the right thing to do was to pull the product. We didn't have to. The product was not wrong, it was right, and it was fortunately and unfortunately wildly successful, so pulling it was a bit painful. But the right thing to do was to protect the trust. We hadn't failed with the product, but I had failed in digging as deep and as fast as I should have as a new leader, and we had failed in our communication to protect our integrity. And so we pulled the product, it took a while for it to come out, and the franchisees afterwards said, you know what, we know you have our backs. It cost us some money, material money for our, our little franchise business. But good things happen when you do the right things for the right reasons. Four months later, an opportunity that was exactly 10 times larger in terms of its profit contribution to our company came along. And it was actually much more potentially threatening to the business. And when I went to present to our franchise community to say this is the product and this is the partnership, their response was, because of how you handled this other situation, we know you will always do the right things. You have our support. It's amazing how when you are there for people when they need it, and you do the right things for the right reasons, and you focus on building trust, all of the opportunities that come to you will be greater as a result. And I learned from that example and from other villages in Africa that it's the small wins, it's the little things that happen over time that allow you to be truly an inspirational leader. Inspirational leaders are not leaders in good times that just keep good things going. Inspirational leaders are the people that when things are tough, when they're unpredictable, when they're unexpected, and when they're changing, can still have a laser focus and vision on doing the right thing for the right reasons and remembering all of the tools in their toolbox to help develop their people and build their businesses. They ask, if not me, who? They believe that they have no borders and boundaries like I did when I was 19, other than what other people set for them. They understand how much small wins make a difference. They have the discipline to manage priorities as an inspirational leader. And they're always asking about what they can do to help others. They take personal accountability to do great things. They don't intend to inspire. The unintended consequence is that they inspire others through their discipline, their partnership, their flexibility, and all of the great accomplishments that they have. So I hope that these messages resonate with you and you can take them back to not only your personal life, but to your business, your classes, and your community. They certainly have made a huge difference in my life. Thank you very much.